Helmholtz theorem. Make sure to watch the next video as well, because the implications of Helmholtz theorem is going to become more clear in the next video. Helmholtz theorem talks about generalized vector fields. You might recall, as it says in the slides, that if you take the curl of a gradient of a scalar function, you'll wind up getting zero. What this means is you have some scalar, and then you take the gradient, which gives how fast things are rising at every point, gives a vector, and then you take the curl, which is how much that's going around. That gradient of the scalar, when you take the curl, will always be zero. And then sort of in a similar vein, if you have some vector field pointing in all the different directions, and you take the curl of that vector field, figuring out what the what the, the circulation is, the circulation density is at every point, and, and you go through, you find that, and then you take the divergence of that, that will always equal zero. Helmholtz theorem states that we can take any generalized vector field and break it into two parts, a solenoidal part where the divergence is zero and an irrotational part where the curl is zero. And this is going to have some really deep implications for physics. So we're going to start with a vector field that is both irrotational, so the curl is zero, and it's divergenceless. And if you wind up having the further uh, constraint on it that it must vanish at infinity, there is only one vector field that does that, and that is the zero vector field. The vector field where every point in space has no vector associated with it seen in the top image. Now, if we want to remove our vanish at infinity constraint, we can have a constant field like we do in the bottom. And what we have there is a vector field, in both cases, a vector field where nothing is flowing out, no divergence, and nothing is flowing around. Now, let's look at fields that are irrotational, so the curl is zero, nothing is going around. In the top case, we have fields flowing out. This means that we have sources. We have a positive divergence, that leads to things flowing out. In the bottom case, we have negative divergences, or convergence, if you will. And with those negative divergences, we have sinks. The vector field is flowing in. But note, in both cases, the curl is zero. Now we have the opposite situation. Our curl is non-zero, so we have a rotational field. But it's called a solenoidal field because the divergence is zero. So in the top image, you can clearly see that you have stuff flowing around, you have a circulation, and with that circulation means that the curl is not zero, but nothing is flowing in or out. Your vectors don't really start any place. And because they don't really start any place, there's no sources, there's no sinks. We call this a solenoidal field. The bottom field, a little less obviously, is also a solenoidal field field because the divergence is zero everywhere. The curl is not, but the divergence is zero everywhere. Now we have the more generalized vector fields. With these more generalized vector fields, there's both a divergence and a curl in both the top and the bottom case. But what Hemholtz theorem says is that we can break these vector fields into a component that is curl-free. We can break it into a component that has a zero curl everywhere, and we can break it into, and then the other component, the only other component, will wind up being a component that is divergence free everywhere. Unless, of course, we have to subtract off some constant. But as long as we specify that our vector fields must go to zero at infinity, we only have those two parts the part that is curl free, the part that is divergence free. We're going to focus for a second on fields that are curl free. So if we make the statement, that the curl of our vector field f is equal to zero. Regardless of what f is, f can always be written as the gradient of some scalar field. Now, in electricity and magnetism, we put a minus sign here. I promise you the minus sign will be a curse and a blessing. When you have a minus sign wrong in one of your uh, homework problems, always check here first. It's a great way to save yourself some time. But this is a scalar field, and our vector field can be written as the minus gradient of our scalar field. And every time this is true, this is true. And every time this is true, this is true. But we can make other statements as well. We have path independence as long as we can have a scalar potential. What this means is that the line integral from A up to B of f dot dl 
is completely independent of path. So this can be uh, equal to any other path as long as you start at A and end at B. So this is called path independent. Independent. And this statement is equivalent to this statement. And it's also equivalent to this statement. So if you can make this statement, you can make this statement. If you can make this statement, you can make this statement. If you can make this statement, you can make this statement. If you can make this statement, you can make this statement. And there's another statement we can make where if we set A equal to B, instead of having an open line integral, we're now going to have a closed line integral of f dot dl. And if A equals B, then we can just evaluate the A and the B. And we can vanish it to a point, make, making our path get smaller and smaller because we're path independent. So this is going to wind up being equal to zero. And this statement is equivalent to this statement, which is equivalent to this statement, which is equivalent to this statement. Well, we got a whole bunch of statements here. There's one other statement that I want to kind of bring off from here. And, and what that is, is that we can always rewrite this with some additional constant. It will turn out in a later video, the fact that we can rewrite this with that extra constant will lead to charge conservation. It's astounding. Oh, I'm so excited for you to see that video. But we have these different statements that we can make. We've got this statement. We've got this statement. We've got this statement. We've got the path independence. We've got it vanishing. All of those statements come from the fact that our field is irrotational. Our curl is zero. They're all equivalent. Now, we are going to look at fields that do have a curl. The curl's non-zero, but the divergence is zero. So in situations like this, we can make the statement that the divergence is going to be zero everywhere. And if the divergence is zero everywhere, this is equivalent to the statement that this vector field can be written as the curl of some vector potential. So before we had a scalar potential V, now we have a vector potential A. Yes, it's going to be physically meaningful, but you'll hear about that in a later video. So if the divergence of F is zero, F can be written as the curl of a gradient, uh, as the curl of a vector potential. And in fact, that vector potential because the curl of a, uh, the gradient of a scalar can be, um, is always zero, we can always add the gradient of some scalar potential to our vector potential. And this part is going to vanish because the curl of the gradient is zero. So this is equal to this. And this statement is equivalent to this statement. And this statement is equivalent to this statement. Now, going on the integral side, we have statements there as well, where if we take the area integral, f dotted with dA, this is path independent, or this is surface independent. So what you can imagine is that you can start off with some surface. Uh, you can start off with some surface and then distort the surface in some way. And it's still going to wind up being the same as long as your boundary is the same. So this is surface independent. 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 Yes. OK. Um, now, this statement is entirely equivalent to this statement. It's also entirely equivalent to this statement. And it's entirely equivalent to this statement. Neato. But we can take this one further, where if, instead of having an open surface like this, we sew all of the edges together for our surface. And now we have a closed surface. As soon as we have a closed surface, and we integrate over our closed surface of f dot dA, this, which is also surface, ind surface independent, so we can, we can change the shape of it, this will always be zero. And this is, of course, equivalent to this statement, and to this statement, to this statement, to this statement, to this statement. I mean, it's just, it's equivalent everywhere. This will also have deep, deep implications for our magnetic field. But you're going to have to wait for another video for, before, we, uh, before we can see how.
This video has talked about the fact that for generalized vector fields, we have special vector fields, some of which have a divergence free everywhere. Those are called solenoidal fields. We also have some vector fields that are curl free everywhere, and those are called irrotational fields. Those are conservative fields. In general, though, all vector fields can be broken into a solenoidal part and an irrotational part and a constant part. If our vector field goes to zero at infinity, the constant part is zero. But it's going to have deep physical implications for the fact that we can actually have all of our vector fields in general be broken into these two portions. Tune into the next video to find out the deep implications.